from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Congress is prepping for a busy fall, plus a preview of this week's USDA production predictions in agribusiness looking at lean hogs. Then the second quarter of uh, next year, 2018, we go up almost 7% over a year ago, so we've got a lot of hogs coming at us. Machinery Pete joins us with top trends from auction and farming without the farmer. This field grown and harvested entirely by robotics. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clint Griffiths. It's Patriots Day, as we remember those from September 11th, 2001. As Irma continues its devastating route, there is at least a down payment in federal funds to help with emergency response. The House voting overwhelmingly on Friday to send a $15 billion disaster aid package to President Donald Trump. The legislation also keeps the government funded into December. The 316 to 90 vote would refill depleted emergency accounts, which have been severely tapped by Hurricane Harvey and now Irma. All 90 votes were cast by Republicans who were opposed to tying the disaster aid to the nation's debt ceiling. It's just the first installment of a federal aid package that could rival or exceed the $110 billion federal response after Hurricane Katrina. Even before the need for disaster aid came up, Congress returned from its summer recess with an aggressive agenda to tackle. Betsy Gibbon has more with what some ag leaders and lawmakers hope to accomplish by the end of the year. There's a long list of items on the congressional docket this fall. From renegotiating NAFTA to dealing with hurricanes, health care, and even dreamers, the work is plentiful. Iowa Senators Joni Ernst and Chuck Grassley penning a letter to Majority Leader Mitch McConnell asking for the Senate to remain in session during the scheduled October recess to work on promises made. For agriculture, many farmers are watching the potential of tax reform. Grassley says the Finance Committee is putting it on the calendar between now and the first week of October. We're going to have uh, some hearings. We're going to have some what you call rump sessions of the committee where we listen to everybody, both Republican and Democrat, uh, and then start writing a bill in October. If it doesn't happen by the end of this year, it's probably not going to happen because there's a midterm election next year. Niefer says regardless of what's included in the package, he expects a reduction in the top tax rate. Another area where I think even if we don't get broad tax reform, Probably what we're likely to get is a reduction in the top tax rate for farm business. If it's truly a farm business, we're likely to get that drop down to that 20% range. Then there's trade, the administration's review of national monument designations, and revamping the controversial waters of the U.S. rule. Well, surely uh, a new uh, WOTUS rule to determine just where federal jurisdiction lies as it relates to, uh, to, to waters. The RFS may also get another look. Some people in my district say the RFS is more important than the Farm Bill. You know, and there's no question that it's made a huge difference in uh, corn prices. Peterson may get a chance to focus on the Farm Bill if a new Farm Bill makes its way to the floor. The way this thing is going, I think they're gonna have no, no accomplishments, you know, coming towards the end of the year. And they might see the farm bill as a way to have a win. However, it could get pushed back to early 2018. Well, yes, either late this year, early next year has been the timeline. So either one of those, I think we'll have uh, floor time. Lawmakers focusing squarely on cotton and dairy safety nets this time around. However, Conaway admits there will be the Supplement Nutrition Assistance Program, too, including things like potentially modernizing work requirements as part of an overall welfare system review. The two and a half years we've talked about SNAP, it's been about reform, it's been about making it work better and more efficiently, and not one time did we talk about cuts for, for the sake of cuts. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Betsy Gibbon. U.S. ethanol supporters are calling upon the government to respond to tariffs Brazil slapped on U.S. ethanol. Growth Energy, the Renewable Fuels Association, and the U.S. Grains Council want lawmakers to take action after Brazil's Chamber of Foreign Trade imposed a two-year tariff rate quota for ethanol imports in late August. 
A 20% tariff will be tacked on U.S. ethanol products once Brazil surpasses imports of about 158 million gallons from the U.S. The president and CEO of the U.S. Grains Council says Brazil is not breaking any World Trade Organization rules with the temporary tariff, but it does break a working agreement the two nations have had for several years. The U.S. is Brazil's number one market for their ethanol. We're, we are um, Brazil is our number one market for exported ethanol. To inject a, a protectionist move into this uh, into this arena makes no sense. When just uh, you know, barely months ago, you know, two industries were talking together about how we can continue to expand global trade in biofuels, let each compare, you know, compete with each other, but on a, on a level playing field. Tomorrow at noon Eastern, we'll get a fresh yield estimate from USDA. The August report turned a lot of heads in farm country. So what do analysts expect this time around? Reuters compiling the average trade guess ahead of USDA. They expect yields to be down from August. Corn analysts looking for an average yield of 168 bushels per acre with total production of 14.3 billion bushels. That's a bushel lower than USDA's August number. Now on soybeans, the trade's calling for an average yield of 48.8 bushels to the acre and 4.3 billion bushels total. That's about a half bushel lower per acre than USDA's August report. Now on wheat, it's really about global production and demand. Look for USDA to increase production estimates in the Black Sea area once again. Doesn't change the trade picture. U.S. hard red winter wheat is now in good demand. It is well priced in the world market. We're starting to see some slow elevation of those world prices. Suderman also expecting winter wheat acreage to take another hit next year, falling beyond this year's record lows. Meteorologist David Harker from Ag Day Affiliate WNDU is in for Mike Hoffman today and has our crop comments. Good morning, Clinton. We heard from a farmer in Jackson County, Iowa. He says the crops are still progressing behind normal, and he also guesses the corn is about 10 days behind. Corn silage harvest should be in full swing this week. Statewide, 60% of Iowa corn is in the dent stage, eight points behind the five-year average. And in Pennsylvania, peach harvest is wrapping up with decent yields. It's being reported apple harvest in full swing. NAS says 98% of the state's apple crop is rated good to excellent, and a whopping 88% of corn is good to excellent. But it's running behind the dent stage. And now here are some hometown temps. Ever wake up wondering what does today's weather have in store? Well, with weather updates, it delivers the local forecast right to your cell phone each morning to make preparing for the day easier. Just text weather 6 to 31313 to get started. All right, we'll talk changes in the supply demand picture for lean hog markets. That's next. Plus, these UK researchers think the future belongs to hand free farming. That story today on In the Country. Let's see how markets finished last week ahead of Hurricane Irma. We get details from our friends on the floor. Hi, it's been a choppy session on, in Chicago on a Friday. Soybeans and the soy complex generally trading just a little bit lower with the uh, corn, the wheat, and the uh, rice trading just a little bit higher here on the course of the day. But it's been an extremely nervous trade, and I expect that to continue even if nothing happens over the weekend because of Irma. Uh, we have some cool and dry weather here in the Midwest. It will warm up next week, but it still looks to remain rather dry. And we need one more good rain in a lot of areas to really bring these crops home. A higher day in livestock markets, at least in the cattle and the feeder cattle. Uh, even the hogs starting to recover into the close, and closed rather, rather well considering. Thanks very much. This is Jack Scoveline, Vice President of Price Futures Group, here on the CME Group floors and comments for the markets. With more capacity coming online, the supply side of the hog market is changing. Tyne Morgan joins us from the road with more. Here now with Don Rose of U.S. Commodities. Don, when we look at this hog market, it's really a supply story right now. When we have these plants coming online um, in the Midwest, you know, we're seeing production ramp up. So it seems like something's got to give demand wise in order to offset that higher production. Well, I think when you look at it, Tyne, you're exactly right. We're in a supply bear market on the hogs. If you look at last year, we have kind of a repeat situation. But in the uh, third quarter, we're going to have supplies up 2% over a year ago. The fourth quarter, we're going to be up 4% over a year ago. Then as we move into the first quarter next year, we go up just uh, 1%. But then the second quarter of uh, next year, 2018, we go up almost 7% over a year ago. So we've got a lot of hogs coming at us. But like you alluded to, you know, the big positive is the fact that we do have some uh, four new plants coming on board. 
two of them immediately uh, in production, going to uh, start out at 10,000 head a day, ramp up to 20,000 head a day. And so that certainly is going to be good for the producer and from an overall competition standpoint. And that's what we really needed is some new demand coming in. Yeah, the supply has a home as far as processing goes. But what about beyond that? When we look at the finished product demand wise, is there a home on, on that end of it? Well, and that's the big question mark. And I think that's the thing that we're trying to figure out, because if you look at the government, they're saying our exports in 2017 were 22 percent of production in this next year, 2018, still 22 percent of production. So it's going to have to come from uh, new exports opening up that we don't see right now. Also, we're going to have to hopefully push up the demand a little bit uh, domestically because that's where the real uh, push is. So it's that combination. It's very much an unknown so far. But with domestic demand, we're kind of past the Labor Day weekend, past that key grilling season. So seasonally with demand and prices, what do we see and do you think that that's the case this year? Well, seasonally what really happens is usually on the hog market, traditionally we don't bottom until we get closer to the first week in November. We just had a, a tremendous break in the hogs. Now we've had a, almost a 50% retracement here and this market is probably going to stall again and we're going to see about the supplies if they start to overwhelm us again. Weights are on the rise, not only in the pork but also in the beef, but we've got a lot of uh, red meat coming at us here in the fourth quarter, uh, not only with pork, but with beef. Real quick, what's your advice then for pork producers looking to price? Well, I think the fourth quarter is always a tough time for producers. So we definitely think that, you know, our short covering rally like we've just had and that we're in the midst of should be uh, used for catch up risk management up around 62 in the December hog, 64, 65 in the October. And make sure to look at all the months going out, even in the summer when they're close to $80 a hundred weight. All right, Don Rose, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. We need to take a quick break on Ag Day, but we'll be right back. For all your risk management and trading needs, call one of the U.S. Commodity Specialists at 800-247-4071. David Harker in for meteorologist Mike Hoffman today. Uh, David, as we look at this map, and we, and we know Irma's going to bring a lot of rain, we just don't know how much, but it's going to be wet in the southeast. Yeah, it sure will be, and it's not just one specific location like Florida or just the Carolinas. No, it's basically a stretch from Florida all the way up into the Ohio River Valley, and as we take a look at the screen, precipitation will continue across the deep south uh, as we look to the next 30 days, but in the immediate future, it's mainly along the southeast where Irma will impact Florida all the way up and down the eastern seaboard toward the central part of the country. Below normal precipitation is likely. We've got a high pressure system building in the upper Great Lakes and then the heat continuing in the deep south. Above normal when we talk precipitation out in the mountainous west, that'll be some relief from the wildfires that have been burning nonstop there in Idaho all the way out uh, to uh, California and as we know into Montana as well. So we take a look at the jet stream coming up here uh, today and uh, notice that we've got Irma making his track through Florida. Eventually impacting the Tennessee River Valley that will eventually be uh, taken up with another upper level system and moved out to sea. A big ridge of high pressure, meaning more heat coming as we look to the middle of the work week in the deep south and the Four Corners region. Hopefully, as mentioned, getting some relief in the mountainous west where the wildfires continue to burn. Uh, we'll see the conditions more or less stabilized for the upcoming weekend, and you'll notice that by that more linear flow from west to east, but that will be short lived as a big ridge providing more heat to the four corners in the deep south. Most of Texas is going to see above normal temperatures as we look to the next, uh, say, week to 10 days. So we take a look at temperatures above normal. As mentioned, that big area of red showing up from the Pacific Northwest down through California, Nevada, and even into Arizona. It does stretch into the upper Great Lakes as well as the Northeast. Below normal temperatures, as we look where the rain showers are going to still be heavy in any area, basically from Southeast Texas, stretching all the way out to the Carolinas, Virginia, and West Virginia too. Above normal when we talk temperatures, in the extreme southern panhandle of Florida. We look 30 days out and there's a below normal temperatures and you'll notice that stretching from the upper Great Lakes region through the Ohio River Valley along the Mississippi River and all the way down into South Texas. Above normal temperatures are likely to be the case in the Pacific Northwest stretching all the way down into Southern California. 
Let's talk precipitation 30 days out and you'll notice a good portion of the country east of the Mississippi River dealing with above normal precipitation. The upper plain states all the way out to Montana, Idaho and Washington state likely to deal with the below normal uh, precipitation. Hopefully a small spike in the rainfall will certainly help those folks dealing with all the above uh, the above normal precipitation and the wildfire. So let's take a look at our forecast for a couple cities. 85 degrees in Twin Falls, Idaho with areas of smoke due to the wildfires. Cross Plains, Texas, 88 degrees with a dry afternoon and we'll likely see in Alta Vista, Virginia, clouds and rain showers with a high of 72. Machinery Pete is keeping his ear open to auction interest. Up next, he'll tell you where buyers seem focused these days. And later in the future, harvest may not mean long hours in the cab of a combine. We'll look at a field grown and harvested entirely by robots. Machinery Pete is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? Machinefinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. During the past four years, when grain prices struggled to rally, sales on new larger farm equipment were stagnant. But as Machinery Pete shows us this morning, used smaller tractors are still fetching some decent prices for sellers. Well, last week, folks, I highlighted a pair of 115 horse tractors, late model that sold very high on recent auctions. Now this week, let's bump up a little bit in horsepower to that 135 to 140 range. And again, same trend. Two tractors, recent auctions, very high prices. So here's a picture of a Kubota M135GX, only 197 hours on it. Sold without a loader, brought $56,000 on a consignment auction in Central Ohio a week ago Saturday, back on September 1st. Now that's the highest auction price I've ever seen on an M135GX sold without a loader. Now last Thursday on a farm auction in North Central Iowa, this 2012 Case IH Maxim 140 with 501 hours on it, sold with an L755 loader and seven foot bucket, went for $80,000. And as I look back through our auction sale price data, that is the highest auction price I've ever seen on a Maxim 140. Now yes, it did sell with a loader, but for perspective, if I look back over the last year, the two highest auction prices I've seen on Maxim 140 sold without loaders were $73,000 and $74,000, but those were both 14 models. And last Thursday on the Iowa auction was a 12 model. So bottom line here, folks, use tractors in very good condition under 150 horse. There's tremendous buyer interest in those right now. All right, thanks, Greg. Now he got a close look at Ram's new farmer focused harvest edition truck during the Farm Progress Show. The company says they polled farmers and asked them specifically what they were looking for in features. Well, the new concept even includes satellite weather data. A farmer can be driving along using the steering wheel audio controls to voice text and then pull up the, uh, the weather radar on his uh, 8.4 touchscreen in the middle of his truck and get all the information he wants to right from uh, the uh, front seat of his Ram. The Harvest Edition was important to us because we've got a great connection with farmers and this was our way to recognize their contribution to America and really salute the farmers work with a hard-working Ram truck. Because of Ram's corporate affiliation, the trucks come in two colors, Case Red and New Holland Blue. All right, when we come back, a hands-free harvest as researchers push to see what's possible. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota. Check out Kubota's RTVX 1140, a rugged utility vehicle with seating for four. Stop by your local dealer today or visit Kubota.com. It won't be long before combines start rolling across the rest of the lower 48 as Harvest 17 kicks into high gear. But what if you never had to set foot in the field? That was the idea behind this concept in Shropshire, England. Researchers from Harper Adams University managing to plant take care of and harvest a field of barley using nothing but robots. We got this video from their Twitter page. They call it the Hands Free Hector. The team getting about $260,000 in government funds to help outfit a tractor and combine with self-guided technology. The project leaders say it's likely the most expensive barley ever grown, but they think that automation is the way of the future, adding that smaller, smarter vehicles could help improve precision agriculture, leading to less soil compaction. They even use drones for scouting and taking samples. 
We've got a claw grabber at the base of it. I mean, fuck, activate the claw or the clam. Cool. So that's the clam actually grants. So when that actually grants, we'll be over the top of the crop. Then we'll fly away and actually uh, bring it back to our area. The researchers say this technology has a ways to go. The tractor they used didn't plant in straight lines and they struggled to get it repurposed for spraying in a timely fashion, adding that there's still something to a farmer going out into the field and observing conditions for themselves that technology can't quite replicate. There you go. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tune in. Start your week with us. For David Harker, Tyne Morgan, and all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Ag Day is powered by Ram Trucks, America's longest-lasting pickups.